Chapter 9 Fluid Lines and Fittings Introduction Aircraft fluid lines are usually made of metal tubing or a flexible hose. Metal tubing, also called rigid fluid lines, is used in stationary applications and where long, relatively straight runs are possible. They are widely used in aircraft for fuel, oil, coolant, oxygen, instrument, and hydraulic lines. Flexible hose is generally used with moving parts or where the hose is subject to considerable vibration. Occasionally, it may be necessary to repair or replace damaged aircraft fluid lines. Very often the repair can be made simply by replacing the tubing. However, if replacements are not available, the needed parts may have to be fabricated. Replacement tubing should be of the same size and material as the original tubing. All tubing is pressure tested prior to initial installation, and is designed to withstand several times the normal operating pressure to which it is subjected. If a tube bursts or cracks, it is generally the result of excessive vibration, improper installation, or damage caused by collision with an object. All tubing failures should be carefully studied and the cause of the failure determined. Rigid fluid lines tubing materials copper In the early days of aviation, copper tubing was used extensively in aviation fluid applications. In modern aircraft, aluminum alloy, corrosion-resistant steel, or titanium tubing have generally replaced copper tubing. Aluminum alloy tubing tubing made from 1100H14, half-hard, or 3003H14, half-hard, is used for general-purpose lines of low or negligible fluid pressures, such as instrument lines and ventilating conduits. Tubing made from 2024T3, 5052O, and 6061T6 aluminum alloy materials is used in general-purpose systems of low and medium pressures, such as hydraulic and pneumatic 1,000 to 1,500 pounds per square inch systems, and fuel and oil lines. Steel corrosion-resistant steel tubing, either annealed Crest 304, Crest 321, or Crest 304 and 1 8 hard, is used extensively in high-pressure hydraulic systems, 3,000 pounds per square inch or more, for the operation of landing gear, flaps, brakes, and in fire zones. Its higher tensile strength permits the use of tubing with thinner walls, consequently, the final installation weight is not much greater than that of the thicker wall aluminum alloy tubing. Steel lines are used where there is a risk of foreign object damage, FOD, i.e. the landing gear and wheel well areas. Swaged or MS flareless fittings are used with corrosion-resistant tubing. Although identification markings for steel tubing differ, each usually includes the manufacturer's name or trademark, the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE number, and the physical condition of the metal. Titanium 3L 2.5 volts Titanium 3L 2.5 volts tubing and fitting is used extensively in transport category in high-performance aircraft hydraulic systems for pressures above 1,500 psi. Titanium is 30% stronger than steel and 50% lighter than steel. Cryofit fittings or swaged fittings are used with titanium tubing. Do not use titanium tubing and fittings in any oxygen system assembly. Titanium and titanium alloys are oxygen reactive. If a freshly formed titanium surface is exposed in gaseous oxygen, spontaneous combustion could occur at low pressures. Material identification before making repairs to any aircraft tubing, it is important to make accurate identification of tubing materials. Aluminum alloy, steel, or titanium tubing can be identified readily by sight where it is used as the basic tubing material. However, it is difficult to determine whether a material is carbon steel or stainless steel, or whether it is 1100, 3003, 5052O, 6061T6, or 2024T3 aluminum alloy. To positively identify the material used in the original installation, compare code markings of the replacement tubing with the original markings on the tubing being replaced. On large aluminum alloy tubing, the alloy designation is stamped on the surface. On small aluminum tubing, the designation may be stamped on the surface, but more often it is shown by a color code, not more than 4 inches in width, painted at the two ends and approximately midway between the ends of some tubing. When the band consists of two colors, one half the width is used for each color. Figure 9-1, if the code markings are hard or impossible to read, it may be necessary to test samples of the material for hardness by hardness testing. Sizes metal tubing is sized by outside diameter, odd, which is measured fractionally in sixteenths of an inch. For example, number 6 tubing is 6 sixteenths of an inch, or 3 eighths of an inch, and number 8 tubing is 8 sixteenths of an inch, or half an inch, and so forth. The tube diameter is printed on all rigid tubing. In addition to other classifications or means of identification, tubing is manufactured in various wall thicknesses. 
Thus, it is important when installing tubing to know not only the material and outside diameter, but also the thickness of the wall. The wall thickness is printed on the tubing in thousandths of an inch. To determine the inside diameter, ID, of the tube, subtract twice the wall thickness from the outside diameter. For example, a number 10 piece of tubing with a wall thickness of 0.063 inches has an inside diameter of 0.625 inches, to 0.063 inches, equals 0.499 inches. Fabrication of metal tube lines damaged tubing and fluid lines should be repaired with new parts whenever possible. Unfortunately, sometimes replacement is impractical and repair is necessary. Scratches, abrasions, or minor corrosion on the outside of fluid lines may be considered negligible and can be smoothed out with aluminum alloy number color of band 1100 white 3003 green 2014 gray 2024 red 5052 purple 6053 black 6061 blue and yellow 7075 brown and yellow figure 9 to 1. Painted color codes used to identify aluminum alloy tubing. A burnishing tool or aluminum wool. Limitations on the amount of damage that can be repaired in this manner are discussed in this chapter under rigid tubing inspection and repair. If a fluid line assembly is to be replaced, the fittings can often be salvaged, then the repair involves only tube forming and replacement. Tube forming consists of four processes, cutting, bending, flaring, and beating. If the tubing is small and made of soft material, the assembly can be formed by hand bending during installation. If the tube is one quarter of an inch diameter or larger, Hand bending without the aid of tools is impractical. Tube cutting When cutting tubing, it is important to produce a square end, free of burrs. Tubing may be cut with a tube cutter or a hacksaw. The cutter can be used with any soft metal tubing, such as copper, aluminum, or aluminum alloy. Correct use of the tube cutter is shown in Figure 9 too. Special chipless cutters are available for cutting aluminum 6061T6, corrosion-resistant steel, and titanium tubing. A new piece of tubing should be cut approximately 10% longer than the tube to be replaced to provide for minor variations in bending. Place the tube in the cutting tool with the cutting wheel at the point where the cut is to be made. Rotate the cutter around the tubing, applying light pressure to the cutting wheel by intermittently twisting the thumbscrew. Too much pressure on the cutting wheel at one time could deform the tubing or cause excessive burring. After cutting the tubing, carefully remove any burrs from inside and outside the tube. Use a knife or the burring edge attached to the tube cutter. The deburring operation can be accomplished by the use of a deburring tool. Figure 9-3, this tool is capable of removing both the inside and outside burrs by just turning the tool end for end. When performing the deburring operation, use extreme care that the wall thickness of the end of the tubing is not reduced or fractured. Very slight damage of this type can lead to fractured flares or defective flares, which do not seal properly. Use a fine tooth file to file the end square and smooth. If a tube cutter is not available, or if tubing of hard material is to be cut, use a fine tooth hacksaw, preferably one having 32 teeth per inch. The use of a saw decreases the amount of work hardening of the tubing during the cutting operation. After sawing, file the end of the tube square and smooth, removing all burrs. An easy way to hold small diameter tubing, when cutting it, is to place the tube in a combination flaring tool and clamp the tool in a vise. Make the cut about one half inch from the flaring tool. This procedure keeps sawing vibrations to a minimum and prevents damage to the tubing if it is accidentally hit with a hacksaw frame or file handle while cutting. Be sure all filings and cuttings are removed from the tube. Tube bending The objective in tube bending is to obtain a smooth bend without flattening the tube. Tubing under one quarter of an inch in diameter usually can be bent without the use of a bending tool. For larger sizes, either portable hand benders or production benders are usually used. Figure 9-4 shows preferred methods and standard bend radii for bending tubing by tube size. Using a hand bender, insert the tubing into the groove of the bender so that the measured end is left of the form block. Align the two zeros, and align the mark on the tubing with the L on the form handle. If the measured end is on the right side, then align the mark on the tubing with the R on the form handle. With a steady motion, Pull the form handle until the zero mark on the form handle lines up with the desired angle of bend, as indicated on the radius block. Figure 9-5, hand benders come in different sizes that correspond to the tube diameter. Make sure to select the correct bender for the desired tube diameter. Figure 9-6 shows hand benders available for different sizes of tubing. Typically, the tubing size is stamped in the bender. Figure 9-7, bend the tubing carefully to avoid excessive flattening, kinking, or wrinkling. 
A small amount of flattening in bends is acceptable, but the small diameter of the flattened portion must not be less than 75% of the original outside diameter. Tubing with flattened, wrinkled, or irregular bends should not be installed. Wrinkled bends usually result from trying to bend thin wall tubing without using a tube bender. Excessive flattening causes fatigue failure of the tube. Examples of correct and incorrect tubing bends are shown in Figure 9A. Tube bending machines for all types of tubing are generally used in repair stations and large maintenance shops. With such equipment, proper bends can be made on large diameter tubing and on tubing made from hard material. The production CNC tube bender is an example of this type of machine. Figure 99, the ordinary production tube bender accommodates tubing ranging from 1 quarter of an inch to 11 halves of an inch outside diameter. Benders for larger sizes are available, and the principle of their operation is similar to that of the hand tube bender. The radius blocks are so constructed that the radius of bend varies with the tube diameter. The radius of bend is usually stamped on the block. Alternative bending methods when hand or production tube benders are not available or are not suitable for a particular bending operation, a filler of metallic composition or of dry sand may be used to facilitate bending. When using this method, cut the tube slightly longer than required. The extra length is for inserting a plug, which may be wooden, in each end. The tube can also be closed by flattening the ends or by soldering metal discs in them. After plugging one end, fill and pack the tube with fine, dry sand and plug tightly. Both plugs must be tight so they are not forced out when the bend is made. After the ends are closed, bend the tubing over a forming block shape to the specified radius. In a modified version of the filler method, a fusible alloy is used instead of sand. In this method, the tube is filled under hot water with a fusible alloy that melts at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. The alloy-filled tubing is then removed from the water, allowed to cool, and bent slowly by hand around a forming block or with a tube bender. After the bend is made, the alloy is again melted under hot water and removed from the tubing. When using either filler methods, make certain that all particles of the filler are removed. Visually inspect with a borescope to make certain that no particles are carried into the system in which the tubing is installed. Store the fusible alloy filler where it is free from dust or dirt. It can be remelted and reused as often as desired. Never heat this filler in any other way than the prescribed method, as the alloy will stick to the inside of the tubing, making them both unusable. Tube flaring Two kinds of flares are generally used in aircraft tubing, the single flare and the double flare. Figure 9 10 A and B flares are frequently subjected to extremely high pressures, therefore, the flare on the tubing must be properly shaped or the connection leaks or fails. A flare made too small produces a weak joint, which may leak or pull apart, if made too large, it interferes with the proper engagement of the screw thread on the fitting and causes leakage. A crooked flare is the result of the tubing not being cut squarely. If a flare is not made properly, flaws cannot be corrected by applying additional torque when tightening the fitting. The flare and tubing must be free from cracks, dents, nicks, scratches, or any other defects. The flaring tool used for aircraft tubing has male and female dyes ground to produce a flare of 35 degrees to 37 degrees. Under no circumstances is it permissible to use an automotive type flaring tool that produces a flare of 45 degrees. Figure 911, the single flare hand flaring tool, similar to that shown in Figure 912, is used for flaring tubing. The tool consists of a flaring block or grip die, a yoke, and a flaring pin. The flaring block is a hinged double bar with holes corresponding to various sizes of tubing. These holes are countersunk on one end to form the outside support against which the flare is formed. The yoke is used to center the flaring pin over the end of the tube to be flared. Two types of flaring tools are used to make flares on tubing, the impact type and the rolling type. Instructions for rolling type flaring tools use these tools only to flare soft copper, aluminum, and brass tubing. Do not use with corrosion-resistant steel or titanium. Cut the tube squarely and remove all burrs. Slip the fitting nut and sleeve on the tube. Loosen clamping screw used for locking the sliding segment in the die holder. This permits their separation. The tools are self-gauging. The proper size flare is produced when tubing is clamped flush with the top of the die block. Insert tubing between the segments of the die block that correspond to the size of the tubing to be flared. Advance the clamp screw against the end segment and tighten firmly. Move the yoke down over the top of the die holder and twist it clockwise to lock it into position. Turn the feed screw down firmly, and continue until a slight resistance is felt. This indicates an accurate flare has been completed. Always read the tool manufacturer's instructions, 
because there are several different types of rolling type flaring tools that use slightly different procedures. Double flaring A double flare is used on soft aluminum alloy tubing 3 8 of an inch outside diameter and under. This is necessary to prevent cutting off the flare and failure of the tube assembly under operating pressures. A double flare is smoother and more concentric than a single flare and therefore seals better. It is also more resistant to the shearing effect of torque. Double flaring instructions to burr both the inside and outside of the tubing to be flared. Cut off the end of the tubing if it appears damaged. Anneal brass copper and aluminum by heating to a dull red and cool rapidly in cold water. Open the flaring tool by unscrewing both clamping screws. Select the hole in the flaring bar that matches the tubing diameter and place the tubing with the end you have just prepared, extending above the top of the bar by a distance equal to the thickness of the shoulder of the adapter insert. Tighten clamping screws to hold tubing securely. Insert pilot of correctly sized adapter into tubing. Slip yoke over the flaring bars and center over adapter. Advance the cone downward until the shoulder of the adapter rests on the flaring bar. This bells out the end of the tubing. Next, back off the cone just enough to remove the adapter. After removing the adapter, advance the cone directly into the belt end of the tubing. This folds the tubing on itself and forms an accurate double flare without cracking or splitting the tubing. To prevent thinning out of the flare wall, do not over tighten. Figure 913, fittings rigid tubing may be joined to either an end item, such as a brake cylinder, another section of either rigid tubing, or to a flexible hose, such as a drain line. In the case of connection to an end item or another tube, fittings are required, which may or may not necessitate flaring of the tube. In the case of attachment to a hose, it may be necessary to bead the rigid tube so that a clamp can be used to hold the hose onto the tube. Flareless fittings Although the use of flareless tube fittings eliminates all tube flaring, another operation, referred to as presetting, is necessary prior to installation of a new flareless tube assembly. Flareless tube assembly should be preset with the proper size presetting tool or operation. Figure 914, steps 1, 2, and 3, illustrates the presetting operation, which is performed as follows 1. Cut the tube to the correct length, with the ends perfectly square. Debra the inside and outside of the tube. Slip the nut, then the sleeve, over the tube. Step 1, lubricate the threads of the fitting and nut with hydraulic fluid. 2. Place the fitting in a vise, step 2, and hold the tubing firmly and squarely on the seat in the fitting. The tube must bottom firmly in the fitting. Tighten the nut until the cutting edge of the sleeve grips the tube. To determine this point, slowly turn the tube back and forth while tightening the nut. When the tube no longer turns, the nut is ready for tightening. 3. Final tightening depends upon the tubing, step 3. For aluminum alloy tubing up to and including half an inch outside diameter, Tighten the nut from 1 to 11 sixth turns. For steel tubing and aluminum alloy tubing over half an inch outside diameter, tighten from 11 sixths to 11 halves turns. After presetting the sleeve, disconnect the tubing from the fitting and check the following points. The tube should extend 3 30 seconds of an inch to 1 eighth of an inch beyond the sleeve pilot, otherwise, blow off may occur. The sleeve pilot should contact the tube or have a maximum clearance of 0.005 inches for aluminum alloy tubing or 0.015 inches for steel tubing. A slight collapse of the tube at the sleeve cut is permissible. No movement of the sleeve pilot, except rotation, is permissible. Beating tubing may be beaded with a hand beating tool, with machine beating rolls, or with grip dies. The method to be used depends on the diameter and wall thickness of the tube and the material from which it was made. The hand beating tool is used with tubing having one quarter of an inch to one inch outside diameter. Figure 915, the bead is formed by using the beater frame with the proper rollers attached. The inside and outside of the tube is lubricated with light oil to reduce the friction between the rollers during beating. The sizes, marked in sixteenths of an inch on the rollers, are for the outside diameter of the tubing that can be beaded with the rollers. Separate rollers are required for the inside of each tubing size, and care must be taken to use the correct parts when beating. The hand beating tool works somewhat like the tube cutter in that the roller is screwed down intermittently while rotating the beating tool around the tubing. In addition, a small vise, tube holder, is furnished with the kit. Other methods and types of beating tools and machines are available, but the hand beating tool is used most often. As a rule, beating machines are limited to use with large diameter tubing, over 115 sixteenths, unless special rollers are supplied. The grip die method of beating is confined to small tubing. 
Fluid line identification Fluid lines in aircraft are often identified by markers made up of color codes, words, and geometric symbols. These markers identify each line's function, content, and primary hazard. Figure 916 illustrates the various color codes and symbols used to designate the type of system and its contents. Fluid lines are marked, in most instances, with 1-inch tape or decals. Figure 917A, on lines 4 inches in diameter, or larger, lines in oily environment, hot lines, and on some cold lines, steel tags may be used in place of tape or decals. Figure 917B, paint is used on lines in engine compartments where there is the possibility of tapes, decals, or tags being drawn into the engine induction system. In addition to the above-mentioned markings, certain lines may be further identified regarding specific function within a system, for example, drain, vent, pressure, or return. Lines conveying fuel may be marked flam, figure 917. Lines containing toxic materials are marked toxic in place of flam. Lines containing physically dangerous materials, such as oxygen, nitrogen, or freon TM, may be marked fin. Aircraft and engine manufacturers are responsible for the original installation of identification markers, but the aviation mechanic is responsible for the replacement when it becomes necessary. Tapes and decals are generally placed on both ends of a line and at least once in each compartment through which lines run. In addition, identification markers are placed immediately adjacent to each valve, regulator filter, or other accessories within a line. Where paint or tags are used, location requirements are the same as for tapes and decals. Fluid line and fittings depending on the type and use, fittings have either pipe threads or machine threads. Pipe threads are similar to those used in ordinary plumbing and are tapered, both internal and external. External threads are referred to as male threads and internal threads are female threads. When two fittings are joined, a male into a female, the thread taper forms a seal. Some form of pipe thread lubricant approved for particular fluid application should be used when joining pipe threads to prevent seizing and high-pressure leakage. Use care when applying thread lubricant so that the lubricant does not enter and contaminate the system. Do not use lubricants on oxygen lines. Oxygen reacts with petroleum products and can ignite. Special lubricants are available or oxygen systems. Machine threads have no sealing capability and are similar to those used on common nuts and bolts. This type of fitting is used only to draw connections together or for attachment through bulkheads. A flared tube connection, a crush washer, or a synthetic seal is used to make the connection fluid tight. Machine threads have no taper and do not form a fluid tight seal. The size of these fittings is given in dash numbers, which equal the nominal outside diameter in sixteenths of an inch. Universal bulkhead fittings When a fluid line passes through a bulkhead, and it is desired to secure the line to the bulkhead, a bulkhead fitting should be used. The end of the fitting that passes through the bulkhead is longer than the other ends, which allows a lock nut to be installed, securing the fitting to the bulkhead. Fittings attach one piece of tubing to another or to system units. There are four types, one, bead and clamp, two, flared fittings, three, flareless fittings, and four, permanent fittings, permass wage, permalite, and serofit. The amount of pressure that the system carries and the material used are usually the deciding factors in selecting a connector. The beaded type of fitting, which requires a bead and a section of hose and hose clamps, is used only in low or medium pressure systems, such as vacuum and coolant systems. The flared, flareless, or permanent type fittings may be used as connectors in all systems, regardless of the pressure. And flared fittings A flared tube fitting consists of a sleeve and a nut. Figure 9-18, to the nut fits over the sleeve and, when tightened, draws the sleeve and tubing flare tightly against. A male fitting to form a seal. Tubing used with this type of fitting must be flared before installation. The male fitting has a cone-shaped surface with the same angle as the inside of the flare. The sleeve supports the tube so that vibration does not concentrate at the edge of the flare and distributes the shearing action over a wider area for added strength. Fitting combinations composed of different alloys should be avoided to prevent dissimilar metal corrosion. As with all fitting combinations, ease of assembly, alignment, and proper lubrication should be assured when tightening fittings during installation. Standard and fittings are identified by their black or blue color. All in steel fittings are colored black, all in aluminum fittings are colored blue, and aluminum bronze fittings are cadmium plated and natural in appearance. A sampling of in fittings is shown in figure 919. Figure 920 contains additional information on sizes, torques, and band radii. And flared fittings are different from MS flareless fittings and they are not interchangeable. 
and flared fittings are easily recognized, because they have a cone at the end of the fitting while the MS flareless fitting has a straight end. Figure 921 MS flareless fittings MS flareless fittings are designed primarily for high pressure, 3,000 pounds per square inch, hydraulic systems that may be subjected to severe vibration or fluctuating pressure. Figure 922, using this type of fitting eliminates all tube flaring, yet provides a safe and strong, dependable tube connection. The fitting consists of three parts, a body, a sleeve, and a nut. Figure 923, the internal design of the body causes the sleeve to cut into the outside of the tube when the body and nut are joined. The counterbore shoulder within the body is designed with a reverse angle of 15 degrees for steel connectors and 45 degrees for aluminum fittings. This reverse angle prevents inward collapse of the tubing when tightened and provides a partial sealing force to be exerted against the periphery of the body counterbore. Swashed fittings a popular repair system for connecting and repairing hydraulic lines on transport category aircraft is the use of permasswage fittings. Swashed fittings create a permanent connection that is virtually maintenance-free. Swashed fittings are used to join hydraulic lines in areas where routine disconnections are not required, and are often used with titanium and corrosion-resistant steel tubing. The fittings are installed with portable hydraulically powered tooling, which is compact enough to be used in tight spaces. Figure 924 if the fittings need to be disconnected, cut the tubing with a tube cutter. Special installation tooling is available in portable kits. Always use the manufacturer's instructions to install. Swashed fittings. Typical permasswage fittings are shown in figure 925. One of the latest developments is the permalite fitting. Permalite is a tube fitting that is mechanically attached to the tube by axial swashing. Permalite works by deforming the fitting into the tube being joined by moving a ring, a component of the permalite fitting, axially along the fitting length using a permasswage axial swage tool. Typical permalite fittings are shown in figure 926. Cryofit fittings Many transport category aircraft use cryofit fittings to join hydraulic lines in areas where routine disconnections are not required. Cryofit fittings are standard fittings with a cryogenic sleeve. The sleeve is made of a shape memory alloy, tidal. The sleeve is manufactured 3% smaller, frozen in liquid nitrogen, and expanded to 5% larger than the line. During installation, the fitting is removed from the liquid nitrogen and inserted onto the tube. During a 10 to 15 seconds warming up period, the fitting contracts to its original size, 3% smaller, biting down on the tube, forming a permanent seal. Cryofit fittings can only be removed by cutting the tube at the sleeve, though this leaves enough room to replace it with a swashed fitting without replacing the hydraulic line. It is frequently used with titanium tubing. The shape memory technology is also used for end fittings, flared fittings, and flareless fittings. Figure 927, rigid tubing installation and inspection before installing a line assembly in an aircraft, inspect the line carefully. Remove dents and scratches, and be sure all nuts and sleeves are snugly mated and securely fitted by proper flaring of the tubing. The line assembly should be clean and free of all foreign matter. Connection and torque never apply compound to the faces of the fitting or the flare, as it destroys the metal-to-metal -metal contact between the fitting and flare, a contact which is necessary to produce the seal. Be sure that the line assembly is properly aligned before tightening the fittings. Do not pull the installation into place with torque on the nut. Correct and incorrect methods of installing flared tube assemblies are illustrated in Figure 928. Proper torque values are given in figure 922. Remember that these torque values are for flared type fittings only. Always tighten fittings to the correct torque value when installing a tube assembly. Over tightening a fitting may badly damage or completely cut off the tube flare, or it may ruin the sleeve or fitting nut. Failure to tighten sufficiently also may. Be serious, as this condition may allow the line to blow out of the assembly or to leak under system pressure. The use of torque wrenches and the prescribed torque values prevents over-tightening or under-tightening. If a tube fitting assembly is tightened properly, it may be removed and re-tightened many times before reflaring is necessary. Flareless tube installation tighten the nut by hand until an increase in resistance to turning is encountered. Should it be impossible to run the nut down with the fingers, use a wrench, but be alert for the first signs of bottoming. It is important that the final tightening commence at the point where the nut just begins to bottom. Use a wrench and turn the nut one sixth turn, one flat on a hex nut. Use a wrench on the connector to prevent it from turning while tightening the nut. After the tube assembly is installed, the system should be pressure tested. It is permissible to tighten the nut an additional one sixth turn, 
making a total of one third turn should a connection leak. If leakage still occurs after tightening the nut a total of one third turn, remove the assembly and inspect the components for scores, cracks, presence of foreign material, or damage from over tightening. Several aircraft manufacturers include torque values in their maintenance manuals to tighten the flareless fittings. The following notes, cautions, and faults apply to the installation of rigid tubing. Note, over tightening a flareless tube nut drives the cutting edge of the sleeve deeply into the tube, causing the tube to be weakened to the point where normal in flight vibration could cause the tube to shear. After inspection, if no discrepancies are found, reassemble the connections and repeat the pressure test procedures. Caution. Never tighten the nut beyond one-third turn two flats on the hex nut. This is the maximum the fitting may be tightened without the possibility of permanently damaging the sleeve and nut. Common faults. Flare distorted into nut threads, sleeve cracked, flare cracked or split, flare out of round, inside of flare rough or scratched, and threads of nut or union dirty, damaged, or broken. Rigid tubing inspection and repair minor dents and scratches in tubing may be repaired. Scratches or nicks not deeper than 10% of the wall thickness in aluminum alloy tubing, which are not in the heel of a bend, may be repaired by burnishing with hand tools. The damage limits for hard, thin-walled corrosion-resistant steel and titanium tubing are considerably less than for aluminum tubing and might depend on the aircraft manufacturer. Consult the aircraft maintenance manual for damage limits. Replace lines with severe die marks, seams, or splits in the tube. Any crack or deformity in a flare is unacceptable and is cause for rejection. A dent of less than 20% of the tube diameter is not objectionable, unless it is in the heel of a bend. To remove dents, draw a bullet of proper size through the tube by means of a length of cable, or push the bullet through a short straight tube by means of a dowel rod. In this case, a bullet is a ball bearing or slug normally made of steel or some other hard metal. In the case of soft aluminum tubing, a hardwood slug or dowel may even be used as a bullet. Figure 929, a severely damaged line should be replaced. However, the line may be repaired by cutting out the damaged section and inserting a tube section of the same size and material. Flare both ends of the undamaged and replacement tube sections and make the connection by using standard union sleeves and tube nuts. Aluminum 6061T6, corrosion resistant steel 304 to 1 8 of an hour and titanium 3L 2.5 volts tubing can be repaired by swashed fittings. If the damaged portion is short enough, omit the insert tube and repair by using one repair union. Figure 930. When repairing a damaged line, be very careful to remove all chips and burrs. Any open line that is to be left unattended for some time should be sealed, using metal, wood, rubber or plastic plugs or caps. When repairing a low-pressure line using a flexible fluid connection assembly, position the hose clamps carefully to prevent overhang of the clamp bands or chafing of the tightening screws on adjacent parts. If chafing can occur, the hose clamps should be repositioned on the hose. Figure 931 illustrates the design of a flexible fluid connection assembly and gives the maximum allowable angular and dimensional offset. When replacing rigid tubing, ensure that the layout of the new line is the same as that of the line being replaced. Remove the damaged or worn assembly, taking care not to further damage or distort it, and use it as a forming template for the new part. If the old length of tubing cannot be used as a pattern, make a wire template, Bending the pattern by hand is required for the new assembly. Then bend the tubing to match the wire. Pattern. Never select a path that does not require bends in the tubing. A tube cannot be cut or flared accurately enough so that it can be installed without bending and still be free from mechanical strain. Bends are also necessary to permit the tubing to expand or contract under temperature changes and to absorb vibration. If the tube is small, under one quarter of an inch, and can be hand-formed, casual bends may be made to allow for this. If the tube must be machine-formed, definite bends must be made to avoid a straight assembly. Start all bends a reasonable distance from the fittings because the sleeves and nuts must be slipped back during the fabrication of flares and during inspections. In all cases, the new tube assembly should be so formed prior to installation that it is not necessary to pull or deflect the assembly into alignment by means of the coupling nuts. Flexible hose fluid lines Flexible hose is used in aircraft fluid systems to connect moving parts with stationary parts in locations subject to vibration or where a great amount of flexibility is needed. It can also serve as a connector in metal tubing systems. Hose materials and construction pure rubber is never used in the construction of flexible fluid lines. To meet the requirements of strength, durability, and workability, among other factors, synthetics are used in place of pure rubber. 
Synthetic materials most commonly used in the manufacture of flexible hose are buna and neoprene, butyl, ethylene propylene diene rubber, EPDM, and Teflon. While Teflon is in a category of its own, the others are synthetic rubber. Buna N Buna N is a synthetic rubber compound that has excellent resistance to petroleum products. Do not confuse with Buna S. Do not use for phosphate ester base hydraulic fluid, Sadril. Neoprene Neoprene is a synthetic rubber compound that has an acetylene base. Its resistance to petroleum products is not as good as Buna N, but it has better abrasive resistance. Do not use for phosphate ester base hydraulic fluid, Sadril. Butyl Butyl is a synthetic rubber compound made from petroleum raw materials. It is an excellent material to use with phosphate ester base hydraulic fluid, Skydrol. Do not use with petroleum products. Flexible rubber hose consists of a seamless synthetic rubber inner tube covered with layers of cotton braid and wire braid and an outer layer of rubber impregnated cotton braid. This type of hose is suitable for use in fuel, oil, coolant, and hydraulic systems. The types of hose are normally classified by the amount of pressure they are designed to withstand under normal operating conditions, low, medium, and high. Low pressure, below 250 pounds per square inch. Fabric braid reinforcement. Medium pressure, up to 3,000 pounds per square inch. One wire braid reinforcement. Smaller sizes carry up to 3,000 pounds per square inch. Larger sizes carry pressure up to 1,500 pounds per square inch. High pressure, all sizes up to 3,000 pounds per square inch operating pressures. Flexible hoses used for brake systems have sometimes a stainless steel wire braid installed over the hose to protect the hose from damage. Figure 932, hose identification lay lines and identification markings consisting of lines letters and numbers are printed on the hose. Figure 933, most hydraulic hose is marked to identify its type, the quarter and year of manufacture, and a five-digit code identifying the manufacturer. These markings are in contrasting colored letters and numerals that indicate the natural lay, no twist, of the hose and are repeated at intervals of not more than 9 inches along the length of the hose. Code markings assist in replacing a hose with one of the same specifications or a recommended substitute. Hose suitable for use with phosphate ester base hydraulic fluid is marked Skydrol use. In some instances, several types of hose may be suitable for the same use. Therefore, to make the correct hose selection, Always refer to the applicable aircraft maintenance or parts manual. Teflon is the DuPont trade name for tetrafluoroethylene resin. It has a broad operating temperature range, minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit to plus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. It is compatible with nearly every substance or agent used. It offers little resistance to flow, sticky, viscous materials do not adhere to it. It has less volumetric expansion than rubber, and the shelf and service life is practically limitless. Teflon hose is flexible and designed to meet the requirements of higher operating temperatures and pressures in present aircraft systems. Generally, it may be used in the same manner as rubber hose. Teflon hose is processed and extruded into tube shape to a desired size. It is covered with stainless steel wire, which is braided over the tube for strength and protection. Teflon hose is unaffected by any known fuel, petroleum, or synthetic base oils, alcohol, coolants, or solvents commonly used in aircraft. Teflon hose has the distinct advantages of a practically unlimited storage time, greater operating temperature range, and broad usage. Hydraulic, fuel, oil, coolant, water, alcohol, and pneumatic systems. Medium pressure Teflon hose assemblies are sometimes preformed to clear obstructions and to make connections using the shortest possible hose length. Since preforming permits tighter bends that eliminate the need for special elbows, preformed hose assemblies save space and weight. Never straighten a preformed hose assembly. Use a support wire if the hose is to be removed for maintenance. Figure 934, flexible hose inspection check the hose and hose assemblies for deterioration at each inspection period. Leakage, separation of the cover or braid from the inner tube, cracks, hardening, lack of flexibility, or excessive cold flow are apparent signs of deterioration and reason for replacement. The term cold flow describes the deep, permanent impressions in the hose produced by the pressure of hose clamps or supports. When failure occurs in a flexible hose equipped with swashed end fittings, the entire assembly must be replaced. Obtain a new hose assembly of the correct size and length, complete with factory installed end fittings. When failure occurs in hose equipped with reusable end fittings, a replacement line can be fabricated with the use of such tooling as may be necessary to comply with the assembly instructions of the manufacturer. 
Fabrication and replacement of flexible hose to make a hose assembly. Select the proper size hose and end fitting. Figure 935, MS type end fittings for flexible hose are detachable and may be reused if determined to be serviceable. The inside diameter of the fitting is the same as the inside diameter of the hose to which it is attached. Figure 936. Flexible hose testing All flexible hose must be proof tested after assembly and applying pressure to the inside of the hose assembly. The proof test medium may be a liquid or gas. For example, hydraulic, fuel, and oil lines are generally tested using hydraulic oil or water, whereas air or instrument lines are tested with dry, oil-free air or nitrogen. When testing with a liquid, all trapped air is bled from the assembly prior to tightening the cap or plug. Hose tests, using a gas, are conducted underwater. In all cases, follow the hose manufacturer's instructions for proof test pressure and fluid to be used when testing a specific hose assembly. Figure 937. When a flexible hose has been repaired or overhauled using existing hardware and new hose material, and before the hose is installed on the aircraft, it is recommended that the hose be tested to at least 1.5 system pressure. A hydraulic hose burst test stand is used for testing flexible hose. Figure 938, a new hose can be operationally checked after it is installed in the aircraft using system pressure. Size designations hose is also designated by a dash number according to its size. The dash number is stenciled on the side of the hose and indicates the size tubing with which the hose is compatible. It does not denote inside or outside diameter. When the dash number of the hose corresponds with the dash number of the tubing, the proper size hose is being used. Figure 933. Hose fittings flexible hose may be equipped with either swashed fittings or detachable fittings, or they may be used with beads and hose clamps. Hoses equipped with swashed fittings are ordered by correct length from the manufacturer and ordinarily cannot be assembled by the mechanic. They are swashed and tested at the factory and are equipped with standard fittings. The detachable fittings used on flexible hoses may be detached and reused if they are not damaged, otherwise, new fittings must be used. Figure 939, installation of flexible hose assemblies slack hose assemblies must not be installed in a manner that causes a mechanical load on the hose. When installing flexible hose, provide slack or bend in the hose line from 5 to 8% of its total length to provide for changes in length that occurs when pressure is applied. Flexible hose contracts in length and expands in diameter when pressurized. Protect all flexible hoses from excessive temperatures, either by locating the line so they are not affected or by installing shrouds around them. Flex when hose assemblies are subject to considerable vibration or flexing, sufficient slack must be left between rigid fittings. Install the hose so that flexure does not occur at the end fittings. The hose must remain straight for at least two hose diameters from the end fittings. Avoid clamp locations that restrict or prevent hose flexure. Twisting hoses must be installed without twisting to avoid possible rupture of the hose or loosening of the attaching nuts. Use of swivel connections at one or both ends relieve twist stresses. Twisting of the hose can be determined from the identification stripe running along its length. This stripe should not spiral around the hose. Bending to avoid sharp bends in the hose assembly, use elbow fittings, hose with elbow type end fittings, or the appropriate band radii. Bends that are too sharp reduce the bursting pressure of flexible hose considerably below its rated value. Figure 940, clearance the hose assembly must clear all other lines, equipment, and adjacent structure under every operating condition. Flexible hose should be installed so that it is subject to a minimum of flexing during operation. Although hose must be supported at least every 24 inches, closer supports are desirable. Flexible hose must never be stretched tightly between two fittings. If clamps do not seal at specified tightening, examine hose connections and replace parts as necessary. The above is for initial installation and should not be used for loose clamps. For retightening loose hose clamps in service, proceed as follows. Non-self-sealing hose, if the clamp screw cannot be tightened with the fingers, do not disturb unless leakage is evident. If leakage is present, tighten one-fourth turn. Self-sealing hose, if looser than finger tight, tighten to finger tight and add one-fourth turn. Figure 941, hose clamps to ensure proper sealing of hose connections and to prevent breaking hose clamps or damaging the hose, follow the hose clamp tightening instructions carefully. When available, use the hose clamp torque limiting wrench. These wrenches are available in calibrations of 15 and 25 in pound limits. In the absence of torque limiting wrenches, follow the finger tight plus turns method. Because of the variations in hose clamp design and hose structure, the values given in figure 941 are approximate. 
Therefore, use good judgment when tightening hose clamps by this method. Since hose connections are subject to cold flow or a setting process, a follow-up tightening check should be made for several days after installation. Support clamps are used to secure the various lines to the airframe or power plant assemblies. Several types of support clamps are used for this purpose. The most commonly used clamps are the rubber cushioned and plain. The rubber cushion clamp is used to secure lines subject to vibration. The cushioning prevents chafing of the tubing. Figure 942, the plain clamp is used to secure lines in areas not subject to vibration. Clamps, initial worm screw type radial and other installation clamp, 10 threads type, 28 threads only per inch, per inch, finger tight plus self-sealing hose finger tight plus 2 2 and a half complete approximately complete turns turns 15 in pound all other finger tight plus finger tight plus 2 aircraft hose 1 and 1 quarter complete complete turns approximately turns 25 in pound figure 941. Hose clamp tightening. A Teflon cushion clamp is used in areas where the deteriorating effect of skydrill, hydraulic fluid, or fuel is expected. However, because it is less resilient, it does not provide as good a vibration damping effect as other cushion materials. Use bonded clamps to secure metal hydraulic, fuel, or oil lines in place. Unbonded clamps should be used only for securing wiring. Remove any paint or anodizing from the portion of the tube at the bonding clamp location. Make certain that clamps are of the correct size. Clamps or supporting clips smaller than the outside diameter of the hose may restrict the flow of fluid through the hose. All fluid lines must be secured at specified intervals. The maximum distance between supports for rigid tubing is shown in figure 943. Distance between supports, in, tube odd, in, aluminum alloy steel slash 9 and a half 11 and a half 12 14 slash 16 and 1 quarter 13 and a half 15 18 slash 20 slash 16 and a half 19 23 and a half 22 slash 25 and a half 24 and 3 quarters 27 and a half 31 26 and a half figure 943. Maximum distance between supports for fluid tubing.